So tonight we have with us um, Lisa Takats Presley, and she's a member of our club and has presented to us previously as well. Excellent speaker with a really very neat background. Lisa has a wildlife biologist, and she's been doing that for about 30 years, working for nonprofit organizations, government, and consulting. And she and her husband, Chuck, started their own consulting company in uh, called Strix, I think that's how you pronounce it, Ecological in 2005. And she works on a variety of terrestrial wildlife uh, projects. And of course, her favorite group is still the owls. And we've had her talking with us about owls previously as well. And so if you would please welcome Lisa for her presentation on nesting and home range of barred owls in managed forests in Alberta. Thanks, Lisa. If you want to take it away, I'm just going to stop my sharing here. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. All right. Is everybody able to see the presentation? Yes, thank you. The full screen there? Great. Yep, and you're coming in loud and clear. Great, thank you. Well, I'm excited to uh, share with you some of the uh, recent work we've been doing on barred owls. And if uh, some of you folks know um, way back when, when I really got into doing uh, uh, research and, and wildlife work in the field, I started my master's thesis on barred owls quite a long time ago. And I, it's like come full circle and I'm able to work with them again, which is really exciting for me and uh, I'll move forward. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some work we've been doing on barred owls and some of their home range and nesting uh, in Alberta. And just wanted to recognize my uh, co-authors, uh, Chuck Priestley, Laura Trout, and Wendy Christina. Uh, I just want to also acknowledge a couple of folks that have uh, passed uh, recently um, that uh, we were really were instrumental in, in uh, getting me excited and working with owls. Uh, Jim and Barb Beck um, took me out on the my very first owl survey for Christmas bird count in Edmonton zone one. And that's uh, that that first night we got a great gray owl and I was hooked. And that's really what got me started on owls. And then Ray Cromie is the one that uh, really introduced me into uh, doing a lot of the banding and, and work right across the central part of Alberta there. So, and he's, uh, he's uh, something, somebody that again, I really wanted to recognize that has passed recently. So barred owl, I think a lot of you are aware what they look like. So uh, a Strix owl, that's our, our company name is actually Strix. Um, and, uh, they're uh, the only owl in Alberta with dark brown eyes, and they get their name barred owl from the, the markings on their chest, uh, upper chest uh, horizontal and vertical down below. Uh, they're kind of a medium-sized owl and uh, closely related to the uh, spotted owl and the great gray owl. Uh, but they're most noted for their calls, and I'm not sure if this will work, but the call will play. Uh, as far as their range goes in the in the province, uh, the birds of the world is pretty close to what the range is, although some of the more provincial um, uh, um, publications that have come out more recently, uh, we do find them kind of further north in the province and more in the east there. We're finding a lot of records up in there, so it kind of expands the range a little bit, but generally speaking, the birds of the world uh, range is is pretty accurate. Uh, as far as management goes in the province, uh, so one of the big things for barred owls is that their breeding territories are associated with older mixed wood forests, and a lot of those forests are in management areas uh, that are used for uh, forest operations or um, oil and gas, where they're 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 um, changing the landscape, clearing and and re and regrowing trees, and so uh, it's a good species to use as a management tool. They're also a co obligate cavity nestery, so they really require a cavity in the forest, a large cavity, be it uh, on the side of a tree or 
um, a large poplar, or sometimes they'll nest kind of in the top of a broken off uh, tree that they has hollowed down and they can climb down inside. But they really like to be kind of secretive. So they climb right down into the tree. So pretty hard to find the nests. They're also um, a good species to study because they have relatively discrete territories uh, most of the year. So they are a resident bird, they don't migrate. And so they maintain year round territories. And when we look at the range of the barred owl, overlap to the, the areas that are in management, you can see that it closely overlaps that. So it's a species that we want to keep an eye on when we're, we're um, doing the work out there. And the government recently has looked at it as a possible umbrella species. That is a species that can, in, if they're there, then it indicates that the forest is intact, that it's healthy, that other species are coexisting in there, and that, uh, that the management is going well. Uh, as far as owl management goes in Alberta, they're covered under the Alberta Sensitive Species Guidelines. So uh, a lot of uh, any kind of uh, changes in the in the landscape that people want to do, they have to go in and do an owl survey to find out if owls are there before they they clear the forest. Uh, barred owls and great gray owl is also uh, listed as a sensitive in the province. And as far as the industry goes, uh, there's been a lot of long-term monitoring by the forest companies to, to kind of monitor the owl species that are on their land bases. So they kind of try to keep track of what's there and make sure that the populations aren't declining or not changing drastically. And you need long-term monitoring with owls because they're a longer lived species. They don't necessarily nest every year. And so some years you may not get many, the next year you'll get more on your survey. But over the long term, you're trying to find out how their populations are doing. So these uh, long term programs that the forest industry has set up are, are a really great way to keep keep track of the populations. We also have the Alberta Nocturnal Owl Survey volunteer programs. So some of the areas that are, uh, you know, more um, in the white zone that are not, um, you know, uh, not really remote, those can be monitored by that that survey. And then Alberta Environment Parks has developed a barred owl conservation management plan. So this gives, uh, gives us an idea of what kinds of things we need to learn about, learn more about to be able to manage for barred owls. And as far as barred owl models go, so models are kind of a, a way to um, incorporate different important things that an owl needs uh, into a, a management. And then they look at that and make sure they maintain different things on the land base or landscape so that the owls will stay there. So, uh, you know, the type of forest that's there, the type of trees that are there, what do the barred owls need in order to be, to be present? Uh, I first did my master's thesis way back in 1998 in the Foothills Model Forest out in the foothills here. And then uh, Ben Olson, um, uh, did a uh, thesis on and used a, uh, developed a model up in Alpax area. And then Mike Russell also did some work up in that region near Athabasca. Um, Jason Fisher did some work out in, out in the east, looking at barred owls and models. And then more recently, Mike Russell um, is working with the Alberta Environment and Parks now in Grand Prairie and developed a model based on some data collection he did up in the Grand Prairie area. And then using that data, as well as the data from his thesis and others, he developed um, a way to model across sort of the boreal region. And so we've got this model developed and now we're collecting this data to test that model. So that's really important to know that uh, you, you develop a model, but then you wanna use data that hasn't been put into the model to actually test whether the model is working. So our work is going till 2024. And this is the area we're working. So much more broad based, broad scale across a bunch of management areas for Weyerhaeuser and West Fraser. And the objectives of our work here are to look at, first of all, the abundance of barred owls, how many are there regionally and provincially in the province. Uh, look at occupancy. So that's more important for knowing where the pairs are. So there can be a lot of owls out there, but when they're paired, that's considered a successful uh, successful thing and whether whether they have young and whether they nest successfully. Uh, we wanted to look at nest tree characteristics, 
uh, home range sizes to find out how much area they require for their home ranges. Uh, habitat use, which would be uh, incorporated into uh, developing a model or testing the model that has been developed by Alberta Environment Parks. And then also looking at territory longevity. So some of the areas we're working in, when I did my thesis in 1998, there were barred owls there. So the barred owls are there consistently year after year after year. So we're thinking that some of those areas are really critical or more important and what's different between those and other places where you get a pair for a couple of years and then they're gone for a few years and then they come back. So trying to look at those kinds of things we think is pretty important. So to find owls to, to do our occupancy surveys, we, um, we looked at the long-term data sets from Weyerhaeuser and West Fraser, and they have been doing these long-term programs along routes, along roads. And you can just see the layout of where the, um, the different sites are. And then the red dots are where we've detected barred owls in the past. So that's where we were gonna go in and look at not only is the owl still there, but are they paired? And that's what we would use for the next part of our project. We also looked at some um, stations that had been surveyed from Alberta Environment Parks from there developing their model. And you can see um, the model shows where the green areas are the most suitable for barred owls and red is where it's not very suitable. And so trying to test whether um, this, this is an owl. So going out late at night, we have to go out after dark, at least a half hour after sunset, and we do call playback. And so uh, doing that is really important because uh, barred owls actually don't call spontaneously very often. So when you're looking for owls, um, if anybody here has done owl surveys for me, you'll know you have that two minute silent listening where you just listen quietly for owls. And then after that, you play call playback. And uh, barred owls rarely call. They only call when they're pairing up and uh, if they're trying to defend their territory, but they don't call a lot. Like you hear great horned owls calling consistently or solid owls will call all night long. Barred owls will not do that. So using a call playback is very important. Otherwise you would only get about a quarter of the owls that you would actually detect if you actually played calls. And so we go out and we play calls for up to 15 minutes originally. And if an owl comes in, uh, then we write it down and then we'll play an additional 15 minutes to try and see if it's paired. So we may be there for up to uh, 30 minutes trying to call. And sometimes it takes almost 30 minutes to get the pair to come in. So they really are quite secretive and quiet in many cases. Uh, so when we went out and did surveys, uh, it just shows you the number of surveys that we did. And uh, we found quite a few owls and really most importantly again is the pairs that we're looking for because we want to know where the pairs are in order to do the next step of the project. From there uh, anywhere that we've detected owls we also recorded a map or drew a map of where the owls were flying in from where they were flying across above us and whether they swooped down low because then we would want to trap them to put a radio telemetry on them. Uh, to trap owls, we would set up mist nets, kind of in an L shape, and we try to set them in open areas, but where there were nice trees uh, for perching so that they could fly across between the trees and hopefully get caught in the nets. Uh, we try to use open areas, cut lines and roads. Once in a while, we'd have to go into the forest, but this was uh, always a bit uh, disconcerting because there's a lot of un um, understory and things that the net can get caught up in. And in one case, we actually ended up having our net actually get knocked right over by the owl and got caught up and we ended up having to throw the net out. So it was really important to have a very clean floor of the, of the, um, the forest that we were gonna set up the nets there. Uh, for luring the owls in, we had our, exciting garden decoy, which actually we talked to somebody in BC who, um, this is how he captured birds. He just took a garden decoy, uh, trimmed off the ears and painted it up. So we had my daughter, Kate, who's become quite the artist, paint these up to look like barred owls. And then we had a recording of barred owl playing and we would, uh, that would call and they would come in and then hopefully catch, catch the owls. 
There was one that we caught up, uh, up north of Hinton. And we were pretty successful. We caught quite a few owls and had a lot of people out working with us. So that was very exciting. One thing that we thought was important to mention is that when we're doing this work, we always also try and encourage people that are working with industry to come out because if they see what we're doing and are really excited about the owls that are in the area, then um, they're, they, they're really receptive to the management ideas and the new ideas we have for how, the, how they're going to be managing the forests. And we had some great people come out with uh, both West Fraser and Weyerhaeuser. Uh, this one person in particular, Jocelyn was so excited. She had an owl in one of her cut blocks and then we ended, they ended up not harvesting that cut block because the owls were nesting there. She said, oh, I wish I had one in every cut block. <laughs> and within two days, we found another place they were harvest, they're gonna harvest, and we found another pair of barred owls and another cut block she was gonna work in. So <laughs> what kills she was pretty uh, she was pretty excited about that. So it gave me a great way to to make sure that they see the value and the importance of what they're doing out there. Well, and people <laughs> always wonder how it is to work with them. <laughs> we have to put a leather glove in front of her. She so these owls are are not uh, not always fun to work with. They can be quite uh, quite nasty with their bites and their talons, and they they do try to to take a, a few few swipes at you. So we have to really work carefully when we're when we're dealing with them. Uh, when we trap the birds, we will first put a bird band on the leg, and we'll age them and. Uh, determine whether they're a uh, uh, second year or an older bird. Uh, from there, we just give you an idea of how many birds we caught in the two years that we've been working on the project. So uh, quite a few different uh, birds, males, females, a uh, couple of pairs in a few of the areas. So that's really good because then you can see how the males and females interact. Uh, additionally to this, we put on uh, satellite VHF telemetry packages, and these are put on like a backpack. So it kind of goes around the shoulders of the bird and kind of rests on the back and it kind of crisscrosses on the chest. And so those are placed on the back. And this is what it looks like uh, when it's first put on. And then you can see when you move the feathers around, it just tucks in nicely underneath. And these transmitters are only uh, three percent or less of the body weight of the bird. So this has been studied extensively to make sure that it doesn't affect their movements or ability to fly. And once that's all done, we were able to release the bird. Just to give you an idea of where these uh, transmitters have been deployed. So this is the area around Hinton. So we had uh, five birds uh, with transmitters in this area. Uh, the Pembina region, uh, so kind of around Drayton Valley and Edson and down to Rocky Mountain House. These are the areas that we have transmitters on birds there. And then we have another study site up in Slave Lake and there's uh, seven birds with transmitters up there, one pair and then um, uh, five individual birds. So it kind of gives you an idea of how far ranging across. We're trying to cover the range of the area, but then also have a few side by side to get some more of that detailed information of, of birds that are, are close, close together and how they interact with one another. Uh, to track the owls, so these uh, VHF or very high frequency transmitters uh, basically um, produce a signal that we use um, uh, a, a device that actually uh, collects that signal and then it creates a beeping sound. So it's kind of like the hot cold game. I like to describe it that way. But the closer you are, the louder the beeping goes. And then you can change the 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 gain and the the sound level as you get closer. It gets louder. Then you turn it down, and then you just kind of move in. And that's how you can track them. Often we can track them right from the road uh, along edges and that. Sometimes you do have to hike up into the forest and get back into the back country where the snow can be quite deep and uh, track them that way. So 
Telemetry in the olden days, <laughs> when I was doing my master's thesis, we used the VHF transmitters to track the owls. And you'd often walk into the forest like this. And there is an owl in this picture. And you couldn't see it or you couldn't find it. So you couldn't see exactly where it was. And then you'd have to try and get a location on it. Sometimes they'd fly away from you and you just, it was very difficult and challenging to find them sometimes. Additionally, we would try to use triangulation. So this gives you, um, you basically go along uh, a road and then at, at each station, you try to see what angle the owl is at. And then you can do three angles to get a triangle. And then that indicates where the owl is out, out away from where you are. And again, this was pretty time consuming. Often you could track one or two owls in a day. That was about it. And this would be the kind of maps that we produce. So this is maps from my thesis of a couple of owls that I had transmitters on. And you can see you'd get, you know, 20, 30 locations throughout the time. And, and that would kind of give you an indication of where, where the owls were. So with the new technology, with these uh, pinpoint transmitters for satellite, we can actually set how many times it takes a location and it takes a location automatically and stores it on the device on the bird. So uh, we set it for every 13 hours and that way you would kind of get a location across the day and across the night. So over time you get a whole range of times through the days and nights. Uh, and then you can set the VHF, what you're gonna track the owl when you go to find the owl, you can set it uh, as often as you want. So we have it set for three days per month, it turns on. And on those three days, we have eight hours to go out and collect information on the birds that have these transmitters. The transmitters last for about 16 months. So you can actually get two seasons of breeding data. And then all you have to do is approach the owl within about 100 or 200 meters. And this pinpoint commander unit, it just wireless, it just sends a signal and it downloads remotely to this device all the data that it's collected for that previous month. And if you can't find the owl one month, well, it'll just keep collecting the data. And then if you collect it next month, it'll download the last 60 locations. So it, it just continuously collects this data, which is uh, pretty, pretty amazing. So it really gets you some really neat data. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through some of the home ranges that we found. Uh, just to give you an idea of how we calculated it. So um, we wanted to divide up the breeding season from the non-breeding season. So we used data that we had collected from uh, barred owl nesting in the province. So we looked at um, the breeding season starting March 1st, because the earliest nest we've ever found in Alberta is March 21st. And so they are setting up breeding territories before that. So we figure that part is important as far as the breeding season goes. So our breeding season runs March 1st. And then by the time they lay eggs, incubate, fledge, and then the young are fed into the early fall, that gets us up to about September 30th before the young are basically on their own. And so we thought using March 1st to September 30th was the best way to consider the breeding season. And the winter season is October 1st to February 28th. And then as far as looking at the home range, so all the little points that we collect, 95% of the points would uh, be collected into that home range. And this is the kind of data we get. So this is really neat. So this bird ha had a transmitter on for 16 months. And you can see that its home range in the, in the summertime was uh, 543 hectares up here. And you can see where the nest is located in there. And then we looked at the winter home range and that just grew huge. So they move way out of their nesting territory and expand. And this uh, male here was uh, 2,700 hectares for a, a winter home range. And you'll see some dots outside. I mentioned that we use 95% of the stations. We'll talk about those dots a little bit later with some of the neat things we're finding with some of this more detailed location that we're getting. And then the next year, uh, the breeding home range was 1,032. So that was this, this past summer. So a lot larger home range. And this owl actually did not nest this last summer. It uh, chose not to nest. Um, and so we think that it, the male just hung around and uh, did not nest this year. 
Another bird that's held a transmitter throughout uh, a long time. So this one here, 269 hectares in the winter, expanded to 489, and then shrunk down to back to 251 during the next nesting season. So this is a really neat, really neat information. There's just huge, huge numbers of data points to be able to get this information, which is really exciting. And then we can look at uh, generally what we're finding uh, across all the this ones that we've collected. So all the females, the mean uh, home range is about 250 hectares and the male had uh, at 280 in the Slave Lake area. Again, looking regionally to kind of see whether there's differences between the regions of barred owls. And this Hinton, Edson, Pemina area, uh, again, a whole range of different size home ranges, but generally females have smaller home ranges than the males. Uh, female summer home range uh, mean is about 300 hectares. The males mean 490, but they're the ones that are feeding at the nest. So the females, uh, the sole uh, incubator and, and sits on the nest with the young. And so the males out there foraging, so it has a larger home range in the summertime. And in the winter, we only have that one male that's held it through the winter and uh, up to 2,700 hectares, just a massive home range, which is really crazy. I never knew that they ranged that far. Some other neat things when we look at it, we can see that uh, like looking at the breeding core, like where they're, the young were on the nest, uh, they, they had a very small area. And then when the young left the nest, of, of course it expands a little bit more. The female's able to fly out more and move around because she's feeding the young and the young are kind of moving around the territory. So you can see that core area. And interesting, if you can see where the nest is, we often think of, okay, this is the nest and then the range should be around kind of the circle around that. But in fact, a lot of the places we looked at, the Svedberg bird and this one here, the nest was right on the very edge of their home range, right in this little pocket there. And then their home range was actually out to the side, which was, which was again, quite interesting to us. Uh, so I talked about looking at these, uh, um, where they foray out away from uh, from their home ranges. And this was really interesting to us. So in the winter time, uh, they would actually move out. So this male here uh, flew out 2.7 kilometer in one, one 13 hour period. He flew all the way out and then spent a bunch of days here and then flew four kilometers back into his range. And then he did a second foray out here where he actually went out 1.6, then spent some time over on this side and then flew back into his home range. So they do these interesting forays and uh, we need to investigate what that habitat is out here to see what, whether it's, you know, something that they're looking for food in the winter time. Another one was the long lake bird. So this one here, he again had his home range on this side, but then this point he went, January, he flew out 2.3 kilometers and spent three days and then went back. He, over here, he went 3.1 kilometers in October and went and then went back to the same area. In March, he flew out and then spent some time in this area. So there's again, this area here, even though we're saying this is their home range, we have to look at these forays as being possibly important areas for them for, nest, for foraging in the winter time. And this one was kind of neat. Uh, my husband said to say, see if females and males talk to each other <laughs> in the barred house. So you can see that the male and the female on different days went out to the same area to find, to, to find something or find food. So uh, there obviously is something that's important out there that they're going to. Other neat things that we found, distance between nests. So these, these ones here, uh, five kilometers between, but also we know that there is another territory in between here that we weren't able to capture, which we're planning to capture this spring. We're gonna try and trap this bird here to see how it fits in with these others, but there's three different territories side by side here. These ones here, are only a mile between the two nests. So it, they, they, they can nest quite close together. As far as nest trees go, uh, balsam poplar, very, very important. We found uh, nine nests this uh, past year. 
uh, seven in balsam poplar, one in trembling aspen, one was a stub, but the rest were all those natural cavities. Very large trees. The only way we could find these nests was because the female was sitting on the nest and we were able to track her right to the nest site. They, they don't flush if you tap the tree, they just sit tight, they don't come out. So very important way of finding them is using the transmitters. There's another one. Again, you can't really see the cavity there, but they're tucked in there. And this one here in the aspen tree. And this was the one in the stub right on the top. So it was actually climbed all, it climbs right down into the stub. And actually once in a while, when we came out to look for, to, to, to track it down, she would actually be calling from inside, kind of this echoing call from inside there. And comparing uh, what we're finding to the literature uh, for Alberta. So this is a paper I wrote back in 2004 when I collected data from uh, all sorts of different folks that have been um, looking for barred owl nests, uh, Ray Cromey, Hardy Platts, a variety of people contributed to this. Um, uh, you can see that most of them are using balsam poplar because that's when you get the really big, big size trees. Aspens don't quite grow that big before they break off and mostly in natural cavities, uh, very few in stick nests and then uh, a few using nest boxes. So just to sum up uh, some future uh, work that we're gonna be doing. So we're uh, expanding up into Grand Prairie this summer, this next summer. And so we'll be looking for occupancy surveys up there. And then we have 23 more transmitters to deploy in the next year. Uh, we're gonna analyze the abundance of barred owls. We'll look at the nest tree characteristics specifically, like collect more detailed information about where they're located and then look at the home ranges for all the ones that we collect that data on, habitat use, and then test that model. And again, looking at that territory longevity. So if owls are there, um, how many years have, been, have they been there? And just kind of take a look at, is there a difference between those than others that are just there sporadically? And then ideally we do have uh, uh, quite a few cameras that we've been using on Kestrel boxes in the past few years. So we'd like to get some set up on some of these barred owl nests to look at their diet and feeding. And then some of the things that we'll look at when we're developing the or testing the habitat model, the things like the diameter of the stand, the trees that are in the stand, like how big are the trees? Is it important to have certain balsam poplar trees that are a certain diameter? The closure of the canopy, that's pretty important for barred owls because uh, they like that protection. They actually um, are preyed on by great horned owls quite often. So if it's an open canopy or if it's very fragmented, sometimes great horned owls will move in. Also uh, the importance of white spruce in the winter time and fur, they like to use that uh, in the winter time and then deciduous component. And we're looking at it thinking that maybe the distance from natural opening or human disturbance might not be too important for them. So when we look at the satellite imagery of this one bird here, you can see that there's a whole range of different things that are happening on that landscape. There's oil and gas, there's forestry, there's gravel, there's a railroad, roads, and there's a actually a provincial park just south of here. And these owls are north of the park. And so, and they really don't even come barely into the park, these ones. There is a pair in the park across the lake there, but uh, this pair is outside the park and has always been on that, on that uh, ridge there. So um, how do they use that? We know that there's some importance to having a closed area for their nesting, but they do move around the landscape quite a bit in these different areas. So I'll just sum up by thanking the people that have been supporting this work, uh, West Fraser and Weyerhaeuser, uh, the Forestry Resource Improvement Association of Alberta, FRIA, for supporting. Um, there's a whole swack of folks that have been working with us on this. Uh, we've had a lot of our field staff, um, our kids are dragged out with us and, and work out in the field with, with us uh, when we're away. Um, Lesser Slave Lake Bird Observatory, Patty and Robin have been instrumental in helping us up in that area, working with us. Uh, the Weyerhaeuser folks, uh, Don, Philip, Jocelyn and Fran, uh, every time they hear about owls or have us in doing surveys for owls, they're great to work with. Uh, Gord and uh, Court and Mike Russell with Alberta Environment Parks, 
uh, which uh, were instrumental in, in, in developing this. Uh, Joel Gillis from uh, BC um, is the one that really talked me through how to put on the transmitters in this new way, uh, makes it much more efficient so we don't have to hold the owls for very long, and the new trapping technique using a garden decoy. And of course, the staff that have surveyed owls from 1995 to the present, uh, the, the, as I said, those long-term surveys uh, really gave us that base to use to find these owls to be able to do this work. And I just want to acknowledge uh, folks in the past that uh, sort of started me on this path way back during my thesis when I when I did that back in the Foothills Mall Forest. There were a lot of people there that, that got me started. And with that, I'll end and answer any questions people might have. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was awesome. Very fascinating stuff you're finding out. So I'll let you go through the chat box. I don't think there's too many in there. And if anybody wants to add that, uh, or after she checks the chat box, unmute yourself, go ahead. All right. Uh, so Doug, in cases where an owl has made a long excursion from its normal area, have you studied those remote excursion points to determine their attraction? So that's our next step. Uh, we downloaded that data this uh, uh, winter, and so we're going to wait till the spring <laughs> until we can get back in there because some of that's pretty hard to find. Uh, there is one area that we can look at that's easier to access, um, and we'll be able to just look at the habitat there and look at uh, seeing if there's like a, a place where there, there must be a food source. I just think it's a food source, a place that, that seems to have a good food source possibly. So we will be investigating that because we're finding this in certain owls. And the other thing I thought was interesting that we might look at is actually uh, in areas that are more fragmented, that have more of the different types of, um, you know, there's 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 cut blocks, there's there's different things. Do they do more forays in those areas versus a more continuous forest? So there might be some interest there in, in seeing whether whether they use it in different ways. <clears throat> looks like their territory is about one to two miles in diameter, much smaller than I'd have thought. Uh, yeah, uh, some of them, yeah, again, depends on depends on uh, what they need. And then again, what what is the force there and what's the food there? So um, I think generally it, it fits with uh, what I've seen in the literature for this home range size of barred owls. They tend to be fairly small home ranges uh, compared to other birds. So great horned owls have quite large home ranges compared to them. Uh, there is a doctor, Peace River, called Laszlo Takis. <laughs> relation? No, it, it, no relation at all. <laughs> uh, are the transmitters removed from the bird at this at some point? Yes. So our goal is to actually remove the transmitters before they they turn off. So we go back and and trap and retrap at the site. Uh, one one we were not able to trap before the transmitter finished. So we're going to try again next spring. Another one we went to trap and he wouldn't come down, but we caught his mate. So we put a transmitter on her. So we'll be able to track her through this winter and then hopefully trap him and her next year. But yeah, the idea is to try and remove the transmitters if possible. The location of the nest in the corner of the range, interesting. Any theories as to why they seem to range as they do? Again, yeah, no, I mean, a lot of times we think of, okay, the nest is important component of their, their life. And then you should put like some circles around there and then, you know, see what's around there. But as you can see, they don't do that. So like a lot of the nests we found were kind of on the edge of where the home range was. And I think it's just a, it might be just a function of what the forest looks like and where, how the layout is. Um, but yeah, I don't have any ideas to why, uh, why they do that. Um, any ideas why they travel so far in winter to forage? Uh, well, winter is a lot more challenging to find food for, for owls and, um, and so I just think, you know, there's no, there's no birds around. Uh, barred owls um, are sort of more generalist predators. So they'll feed on things that are, um, that come up as available. So in the summertime you get like, um, 
uh, insect outbreaks and they'll feed on insects. Um, Jim Duncan just recently uh, published a paper in the Blue Jay on, on um, little, little worms. The barred owls were focusing on worms when they all came out. And so they were actually feeding on these worms um, or they'll feed on um, uh, uh, wood frogs as they emerge from the, from the pond. So they'll, they, they do these sporadic invasions and they'll feed on those things. So those things aren't available in the winter. They're really strictly more of a feeding on mice and, and squirrels and things like that. So, so I think it's just, there's not as much food. So they, they need to expand their range to spread out where they're finding food. Uh, do barred owls mark their territories? Curious as to what homing strategy they use to be able to return to nests or to favorite hunting grounds. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's been a question for me for years is how do they know where things are in the environment? Like female will call from the nest and so she can call him in, but um, they just, they, they, they know, they, they map their territory and they know where it is. Um, we were up uh, trapping great grays uh, last week up north and the, you have these great gray owl invasions or hawk owl invasions how do they know to go to that spot? Like they don't have a telephone to call another owl to from the other side of the province. So you'll get hundreds of owls in one area. And then that, that spring, they just move all out and away again. So we don't really understand how they communicate or how they, they're able to find the, these places to, to find food. Is there anything you collect from the birds that helps to determine fitness of the individual? Uh, yeah, so we do look at the weight, so definitely the weight, and then we look at the feathers and that to make sure that they're, they're a healthy bird. So we would never put a transmitter on a bird that's too light or thin. Um, these birds are all um, are in very good form. They're, they're, they're um, like we don't see really any damage to them or anything there. They're in really good shape when we collect, when we catch them. So, um, yeah. Uh, barred owls seem to be generalists able to adapt to highly developed areas so are they the best species to determine forest health in Alberta in your opinion? Uh, I think out of all the owls I think they are in a sense that they require certain things in the forest to be able to um, to, to have in that forest. So they need a, a large tree and large cavity tree. They need a fairly intact old growth piece of forest. Um, and the other thing is barred owls over time, they can adapt slowly to change, but they're not able to adapt quickly to change. So if you do too much in the area and like take out everything they need, they're out of there. If you change things more slowly, then uh, they're able to adapt over time. And in fact, we can see that with the barred owls in, all, in, in the river valley, they were, they were there. We have histor historical records, then they left. And then over time, they were able to move back in as we started managing the, the area and, and, and making sure that those, those trees were there for them. So I think over time, they are, and from what we're doing, we also collect data when we're out there on all the other species that are in the area the barred owls are using, and a lot of other species that are considered species of concern, um, oven birds, um, like some of the old growth warblers, they all need that big old growth forest. Um, and so we're making sure that the barred owls um, sort of indicate those other species. So getting that idea of an umbrella, if they're there, a whole bunch of other species will be protected as well. Uh, do barred owls mate for life? Yes. Yes. From what we know, they mate for life. Um, but they will, if they lose a mate, they will find a new mate. Uh, would it be interesting if you could find a relationship between habitat quality and nesting success? Yeah, so that's why we were collecting information on nesting success. So um, everywhere that we put transmitters on birds that we had a pair that we, uh, we knew was there, we tried to find the nest and then we followed up to try and find if the young, that the, there were young from that nest. And so we do know that from those, those um, uh, nine nests that we located. 
Can one make a nest example gouging out a tree? Yeah, uh, they readily use nest boxes. So you can build a basically a large box for, for barred owls and they readily will take them. Um, in fact, there was a tree that was uh, had a, a nest and then the nest tree broke off and uh, somebody put up a box in the same area. But the other thing is, is barred owls don't often use the same nest year after year. So you, they will switch between nests kind of like a goshawk does as well. And I think that's an idea for uh, predators as well to make sure that they don't get cued in onto one, one specific plot place that uh, the barred owls are. So we've never found an owl using the same nest in a consecutive year. Um, I'd have to look back to see if, uh, I don't know if uh, Ray's nest boxes, whether he had many consecutive years. I think he had a few that every second or third day would be there, but not always. Do Alberta forest companies in general control poplars with spraying when replanting, reducing nesting potential? Uh, there is spraying going on for, for, for that. Um, but really the, the key is for um, barred owls, it's that um, protection of sort of those big trees. So now what they're doing is they're, um, when they're doing their managing, when they do their forest harvesting, they leave retention plots and protection areas, and they leave a lot of these um, trees that are really important nesting structures. All stick nests are protected with 100 meter buffers. And so it's a way to manage the forest over time so that the forest regrows outside and then it keeps that kind of core area and then they're able to, to move back in more quickly. Is a tree harvest cycle sufficient to allow poplar trees to mature? And that's where the uh, this whole modeling is going. And that's that. I mean, the government is focused on making sure that the forest companies are managing in a way that's sustainable for all species. So um, the idea is that over the long term, using these models to make sure that over time, the same amount of forest is there uh, present for barred owls. Do their home ranges overlap with great horned ranges? Or are they actively avoiding great horned? I think they actively avoid. I mean, areas that we're doing our work, we, we rarely hear a great horned owl in the area. And in fact, during my master's thesis, two of my barred owls were killed by great horned owls. Uh, Gordon Court has also found that, um, and and Ben Olson as well, they found that some of their telemetered birds were killed directly by great horned owls. So it's not only managing for the forest that's there for barred owls, but also kind of managing against great horned owls. So if you open up too much around the nest site, for example, it gives more susceptibility to great horned owls. So that core range, we don't see them overlapping with great horned owls too much. Any wow. other questions? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> yes, a lot of keeners, a lot of interesting awesome. questions and a really awesome. interesting presentation. So thanks again, Lisa, that was awesome. Um, so that's it for today, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you for the next session, uh, many of you on the winter bird ID. I think Art might still be here if somebody has a question for him about the Fort Saskatchewan uh, Christmas bird count. If not, um, that's it for today. And thanks again, Lisa. And we'll be looking forward to seeing more of you in the new year and have a great holiday season if I don't see any of you or some of you before then. <laughs>